a lot of people, it's, it's just mud, right? I mean, I would say not to just a lot of people, to almost everybody, it's, it's just mud. So these were pretty clever people that went out and, you know, realized the potential for just looking at mud, for thinking about how Earth has changed in the past. It's pretty clever people who thought to look at, you know, what were the tiny fossils within that mud and how those reflect past climate change and past warm and cold conditions. Following the collection of these early sediment cores, the field of paleoceanography and paleoclimatology was developed. And from that, we recognize that Earth has gone through some major climate changes in the past. And so now, in 2023, we're at the point where we can ask very targeted questions and try to better understand processes, what drove those changes in the past. I'm Dr. Shannon Klotzko. I am a marine geologist. I'm one of the PIs on the project, which uh, stands for Principal Investigator. And I'm one of the co-chief scientists on the cruise, um, where we'll be at sea for 30, 33 or 34 days, I think, at this point, but over a month at sea to collect our data in Baffin Bay. Well, we're going to go and study Greenland. It's a pretty large ice sheet. There's about 22 feet of sea level rise if it were to melt entirely. So just thinking about how that can affect climate. Um, but we don't really know what causes destabilization of these big ice sheets. So we're interested in the cause of the initial retreat of the West Greenland ice sheet after the end of the last glacial maximum, which is essentially the last ice age. On this expedition, I'm going to be working mainly to make sure that we get the best cores that we possibly can, that we find the locations where the best mud is for us to use for our purposes. And then after the expedition, I'll be working on the stratigraphy and time scales of the cores that we recover. Now we got a crew of 21 people, scientists from six institutions. We're kind of all working together with our own questions to try and get at this bigger question of what causes the destabilization collapse of these ice sheets. We will be traveling in time to see what this place was like 15,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, and so on. That's a time when the ice was melting rapidly. And so by, by traveling in time like this, we are going to understand how ice melts during a warming climate. We're going to ask questions like, how fast did it melt? How fast did sea level change? What mechanism caused it to melt? Was it a warming atmosphere that melted it from the top? or was it a warming ocean that melted it from the bottom and snuck in under the ice? And so the only way to do that is by living in this time world to see things that really happened. It's not hypothetical, it happened. One of the things, the main things that we're gonna be doing, sort of the exciting part, what a lot of the things are happening on deck is the sediment coring. The seafloor is really big, the ocean's gigantic. How can we pick a core location? Where do we want to take a sediment core from? Well, what we need to know is what are the layers below the seafloor? Because where you want to sample very specific types of layers of Earth history. And everywhere you go in the seafloor, you're going to see sediments from different processes. Some might be a really good archive where it has a 10,000 year time frame. Some might have a 30,000 year time frame that we can sample with the lengths of cores we have. But we don't actually know what's there. Is it all jumbled up and mixed? So if we took a sediment core, it just looks like mush and there's no layers, no information in time. Or is it actually have all these nice fine layers? And so we're interested in finding deposits that have a whole bunch of really fine layers to see a really good sequence of the past that we can core through. So we have an idea, a rough idea of where we want to go, but in detail um, we need to use geophysics, which uses sound emitted from the ship to try and image the seafloor. 
and we use those images to try and understand how the sediment is deposited and how the sediment is accumulated in different places and that allows us to better target and better hone the areas we want to study. So seafloor sediments are almost like reading pages of a book. The further you go down into those sediment cores, it's like going deeper and deeper and deeper in time. So if we want to go back into the past, we can collect sediment cores and then go down further down in the sediment record and identify periods of time um, when those sediments were deposited and we can use those sediments to reconstruct the environments that happened at those times. Stratigraphy is 90% of geology. If you don't know where you are in time, then those changes are almost irrelevant. You have to know, you know, not only what is occurring, but when those changes are occurring. If we didn't know time, we might get records that say ice sheets have changed in the past, but so what? So knowing the context of time is, you know, fundamental to everything we do. Extracting sediments from the seafloor is a very complex process that people actually have been doing for a long time with a variety of different methods. We're using three different types of coring, multi-cores, gravity cores, and jumbo piston cores. And the basic principle of each of them is we send down a tube that can contain the mud with a weight on top and a seal on the bottom. And that tube is penetrated into the mud is sealed at the bottom and then we pull it back up and hopefully we haven't disturbed it too much and we get a nice record that can read basically like a book from bottom to top. My job is to be able to read the mud, understand what are the potential stories that it's telling us and then to figure out how we can relate those stories at one location to all the other stories that we're collecting from the seafloor. So instead of having one core just stand on its own, of being like, this is a record of this one location, it's about figuring out how that one location relates to every other one of these locations that we're coring. So most of our piston cores we did were about 60 feet long, but even the gravity cores that are 20 feet long, we can't really deal with a tube of mud that's 20 feet long. So the very first thing we do after we get it on, the, on board is to cut it into sections that are about five feet long. And then we bring it into our MST van. The core goes into the multi-sensor track van where we make a number of measurements on the core to characterize its physical properties and its composition. And that includes taking x-ray images of the core uh, so we can actually see what is in the sediment itself. Uh, and then we split the core open in half, so we get two halves of the core, a working and archive half, which we describe and we photograph. Once we're done here, the cores will get shipped to a core repository, and so core repositories are like libraries of mud, and can then be used by us and other researchers in the future to sample, to do later on characterizations and analyses, and uh, be preserved for decades and decades to come. We use a variety of different approaches. We use sediment geochemistry, we use sediment magnetics, we use sediment physical properties. So the composition of the sediment itself can tell us a lot about where the ice sheet was. And then we also use chemistry of foraminiferal shells or small little animal shells from the past and we can reconstruct the composition of the water at the same time. Hopefully we can put those two things together and see how the ocean and how the ice sheet responded to each other. But what it's really doing is allowing us to observe a critical part of the Earth system, these sort of like ice, ocean, atmosphere interactions from a wider lens than we can with just historical observations alone. It gives us a greater appreciation of the range of possibilities and, and, and the different variations that, that could occur in these systems. Part of the legacy of the cruise is having those cores available to other people and you know how they can use them how they can think about the questions differently um, how we archive them is almost important as how we recover them so we got to make sure that they're kept in a refrigerated cold environment that we can keep for decades each publication of the scientific literature is an approach toward truth, but truth is, is 
always something we strive to get closer and closer to. We don't deliver it, signed, sealed, and delivered. To understand and have uh, projections of the potential changes in Earth's future, we need to understand how Earth has changed in the past to see what could potentially happen in the future and what deviations from Earth's natural processes are occurring and could occur in the future. And so to do that, we need to get a good record of the past. I really love investigating the past and learning about Earth history and how it's changed through time. We have a very dynamic planet and uh, our surface changes so much, especially with sea level and glacial periods and how you have landscape change and go back and forth in these cycles. And I think it's so cool and fun to uh, investigate the history of our Earth and, and, and try and resolve different mysteries.